Tonight, the major sentence for R. Kelly, the one-time star, will likely spend the rest of his life behind bars. The disgraced R&B singer, sentenced to 30 years in prison after he was convicted of using his celebrity status to sexually abuse and exploit young women and girls. His victims confronting him in court after waiting for decades for this day, plus the powerful message from the judge before she handed down a sentence longer than what prosecutors asked for. We're live outside the federal courthouse in Brooklyn. Also, the first look at the man accused of driving a big rig where more than 50 migrants died after the truck was left in the sweltering Texas sun. Tonight, the death toll rising as we learn new details about where that truck traveled hours before authorities say they found, quote, piles of bodies inside. The alarming new travel warning ahead of July 4th weekend. Delta Airlines already forecasting flight delays and cancellations, now allowing customers to rebook their flights for the holiday weekend without change fees or price increases. Nearly 3,000 flights canceled just this week alone. Paralyzed in custody, the disturbing video from Connecticut police showing the moment a man slammed against the wall of a police van after an arrest. Officers then seen dragging him across the floor and then restraining him inside a jail cell. The new allegations from his family, who say he was so severely injured, he's now on breathing and feeding tubes. Dangerous encounter, the bison charging a small child in Yellowstone National Park. A 34-year-old man gorged after stepping in between. The stern message from park officials who say the tourists came way too close to the 1,800-pound animal. And TikTok spying? Why the FCC is now urging Apple and Google to remove the popular app immediately. Top story starts right now. Let's begin with NBC's Ron Allen, who was inside the courthouse today. Disgraced music superstar R. Kelly, now likely to spend the rest of his life in prison, sentenced to 30 years, convicted of luring young women and girls into his orbit and sexually abusing and exploiting them. Judge Ann Donnelly saying Kelly left a trail of broken lives in his wake. You raped them, beat them, separated them from their families, saddled them with an incurable, sexually transmitted disease. 30 years did he do this, and 30 years is what he got. I thank all of you all that have stood in support of us for so long. Earlier, several of Kelly's victims confronting him in court with emotional impact statements, calling him shameless, disgusting, a predator. I wished I would die because of how low you made me feel, said a woman identified only as Jane Doe. This happened to me a long time ago. I was 17. I'm 45 today. I never thought that I would be here to see him be held accountable for the atrocious things that he did to children. I believe I can fly. The multi-platinum artist, once known as the Pied Piper of R&B, was convicted of nine counts of sex-related crimes last September after decades of allegations of sexual misconduct. Crimes dating back to the 1990s. Among his first victims, the singer Aaliyah, who prosecutors accused Kelly of marrying illegally when she was 15 to avoid being charged with sexually abusing her. Today in court, Kelly stared down at the defense table, never looking at his accusers and choosing not to address the court. All right, with that, Ron Allen joins us now live from that courthouse in Brooklyn. So, Ron, you said he didn't say anything in court today. What's next for R. Kelly? Does he have any plans for an appeal? Yes, his attorneys say they're going to focus in on the racketeering charge that he was convicted of. They say that this was not a criminal enterprise, that these were isolated incidents involving various women that weren't connected. Of course, that's exactly what he was convicted of, running an enterprise. The judge also had some very harsh words for enablers, as she called them, managers, drivers, others, who were helping R. Kelly do this over this 25-year period. No one else faces charges, but stay tuned. That might come as well. And there are other cases. Kelly faces uh, charges of, of child pornography in Chicago. That case begins, that trial begins August 15th, and he still faces charges after that in Minnesota. And, of course, he's probably going to spend the rest of his life in prison while he's fighting the, all of that as well. Tom? All right, Ron Allen for us tonight, leading us off. Ron, we appreciate it. Now to that horrific scene in San Antonio, Texas, and the migrants trapped inside a semi-truck left out in the heat. The death toll now rising to at least 53 NBC's Morgan Chesky learning more about those victims and those suspected to be responsible. 
Tonight, stunning new evidence in what officials are calling the nation's deadliest case of human smuggling. This empty trailer, now tied to the deaths of 53 men, women, and potentially children left packed inside. Among the dead, four Hondurans, including two brothers, Alejandro and Fernando Caballero. Today, their mother mourning their loss, saying her sons were anxious but excited for a future where they could work to build their mom a new home. Mexican authorities cooperating with U.S. investigators are painting a grim picture of the deadly journey. After crossing the border in Laredo, Mexican officials say at 2.45 p.m. Monday, the truck passed through a Border Patrol checkpoint in Encino, Texas. A camera capturing the driver, identified by Mexican authorities as a now-detained U.S. citizen who then drove through Catula before stopping 146 miles later in San Antonio on a 100-degree day. It's a lot of coordination, so it's suggestive of a higher level organization. Special Agent Craig Larrabee runs Homeland Security investigations covering the southern Texas border. These organizations, yep. potentially cartels, yep. they're really looking at these people as a product. Just a product, a commodity. I mean, that's it's just simple. More people, more money, more profit. On the border, Governor Greg Abbott promising additional checkpoints. Today, alongside the remote road where so many lives were lost, a somber memorial marked by flowers and bottles of water for those no longer here. All right, Morgan Chesky joins us now live. Morgan, you know, two moments really stand out to me. One, a quote from law enforcement saying that when they, they entered that tractor trailer, they just saw, quote, piles of bodies. And then the photos you just showed of, the, of that those Honduran friends, that family, uh, it, it brings it home to who these people were. I know you have some new reporting tonight about the suspects, about the criminals who, who were behind this smuggling operation. Yeah, Tom, we do, and we're learning more every day about the victims and the suspects in this horrific case. Uh, as far as those three individuals that have been detained as a result of this, uh, we have learned that one is an American citizen, and we do believe that he is the driver of that truck. While he has not been charged, he is in custody at this time. Uh, no comment from him as of right now. Meanwhile, those two others detained are Mexican nationals. Uh, their only charges that they're facing as of right now, Tom, are they're letting their visa expire and illegal possession of firearms. Tom. All right, Morgan Chesky with that new reporting tonight. Morgan, we thank you for that. Next, we head to the travel trouble ahead of this holiday weekend. Get this, Delta Airlines has already issued a travel warning, and it's giving customers the option to change their flight to avoid it if they're flying this weekend. This comes as over 500 flights were canceled today, on top of the thousands this past weekend, as airlines struggle with pilot shortages. So how long is this going to take? NBC's Tom Costello has more. The email warning from Delta, prepare for operational challenges this weekend. Passengers can rebook their flights with no fare difference or change fees. So far, roughly 3,000 flights canceled this week alone, even on blue sky days. For now, we are a little bit stranded. Uh, we don't have a way to get to Raleigh. The FAA warning today, summer storms are creating problems. Obviously, there'll be delays throughout the southeast, no matter what airport you're at, from Charlotte all the way down southbound. American and Delta to have canceled the most flights this week. The biggest problem, still not enough pilots to fly their schedules after thousands took early retirement during the pandemic. Tomorrow, off-duty Delta pilots plan to picket outside airports nationwide, demanding changes to pay, benefits, and schedules. The cumulative effect of continuously flying overtime month after month after month just adds up. And, you know, pilots are making that tough safety call and, and to, to say, I'm, I'm not going to do it. Delta says its goal is to provide pilots with the best compensation based on pay, retirement, work rules, and profit sharing. United, American, and several regional carriers have already raised pilot pay, even tripling it. But Transportation Secretary Buttigieg tells Lester raising the mandatory pilot retirement age beyond 65 is not likely. Right now, uh, we have these kinds of requirements based on safety judgments, uh, and I haven't seen any change in the safety rationale for that. All right, Tom joins us now from Washington. And Tom, you mentioned in your piece the biggest challenge for airlines right now is staffing. But you think about this pilot problem, and this is not a quick fix. It's not a seasonal problem. So when are you hearing that, that these airlines expect to be fully staffed again? Uh, brace yourself, because we could be talking, if we're lucky, 
through the end of the year. Maybe things will improve towards Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, but it's entirely possible this will be something we deal with for years in some fashion. Hopefully we'll get over the worst of it, but it's gonna take years to get enough pilots uh, hired and trained and in the meantime, they have their normal attrition rate, right? You, they got people who are, they're hitting the, the retirement age of 65 and they're checking out. So this is gonna be a, a constant battle for the airlines to get enough pilots in the cockpit. Tom Costello with a sobering assessment of air travel in America right now. Tom, we thank you. Okay, we have a breaking update tonight in the January 6th hearings. The House Committee just announcing moments ago subpoenas for former Trump White House counsel, Pat Cipollone. It comes after shocking testimony from Trump White House insider Cassidy Hutchinson, but a source tells NBC News the Secret Service is pushing back on some of those claims. NBC News Chief White House correspondent Peter Alexander has the latest. First, Cassidy Hutchinson's explosive testimony, now the fallout. The committee tonight issuing a subpoena for former Trump White House counsel Pat Cipollone after Hutchinson detailed Cipollone's effort to reject Mr. Trump's original plan to join his supporters as they converged on the Capitol. Mr. Cipollone said something to the effect of, please make sure we don't go up to the Capitol, Cassidy. Keep in touch with me. We're going to get charged with every crime imaginable if we make that movement happen. Hutchinson, a 25-year-old former aide to Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, also testified she heard Mr. Trump demand armed supporters be allowed through security ahead of his January 6th speech. I overheard the president say something to the effect of, you know, I, I don't effing care that they have weapons. They're not here to hurt me. Mr. Trump denies that claim. And tonight, other portions of Hutchinson's sworn testimony are being disputed, like when she said Deputy Chief of Staff Tony Ornato told her Mr. Trump got physical with his lead Secret Service agent, Bobby Engel, inside the presidential SUV. Mr. Engel grabbed his arm, said, sir, you need to take your hand off the steering wheel. We're going back to the West Wing. We're not going to the Capitol. Mr. Trump then used his free hand to lunge towards Bobby Angle. But now a source close to the Secret Service and Ornato tells NBC News Mr. Trump never grabbed the steering wheel and never assaulted Angle, and that Ornato never told Hutchinson those events occurred. But they don't deny Mr. Trump was furious and wanted to go to the Capitol. Secret Service insiders say Angle and Ornato remain close to Mr. Trump. The Secret Service says its agents are available to testify under oath. Also tonight, Mark Meadows is disputing Hutchinson's account that he asked for a pardon. Meadows is declining to cooperate with the committee, citing executive privilege. And former White House lawyer Eric Hirschman is challenging Hutchinson's testimony that she wrote this note with wording for Mr. Trump to condemn the violence. That's your handwriting, Ms. Hutchinson? That's my handwriting. But Hirschman's spokesman says Hirschman wrote the note. Top Republicans tonight are slamming Hutchinson's testimony. It looks like, you know, one more day of salacious headlines. This is why Pelosi set this up from day one to be a partisan committee, a witch hunt just to keep going after Donald Trump, not to get faxed. But committee Democrats are dismissing any criticism. Nobody is challenging the central material facts of her testimony that Donald Trump and Mark Meadows were perfectly aware that there were armed people in the crowd, which he then aimed uh, like a missile at the U.S. Capitol. Late tonight, Hutchinson's lawyer is saying she stands by all of the testimony she provided yesterday under oath. All right, Peter Alexander joins us now from Washington. So, Peter, you know, last night you had that major scoop that a source close to the Secret Service disputed some of the allegations that were being made in that January 6th committee hearing. So, you know, I guess a lot of people want to know, will those Secret Service agents eventually testify? Yeah, it's a good question. I spoke to the Secret Service again tonight, and they say that any and all of their agents are prepared to testify under oath right now. We've yet to hear from the committee if they will request to hear from those individuals. But a Secret Service spokesperson also tells me that at no time were they asked to corroborate that new information about what happened inside the presidential limo, as recounted by Hutchinson in her testimony. The bottom line at the end of the day is, I'm told by multiple sources, that both the SUV driver and the Secret Service lead agent in the front seat and Tony Ornato, that senior staffer, all dispute Hutchinson's telling of that story. Yeah, we're just going to have to wait and see now if they have ever appear before the January 6th committee. Yeah. Speaking of the committee, we're also hearing from Ginny Thomas, Justice Clarence Thomas's wife, about the possibility of her appearing before the committee. And if you can, remind our viewers why this is, would be so important. 
Yeah, no doubt. So Jenny Thomas, as you know, she's a conservative activist. She sent text messages to the former chief of staff to President Trump, Mark Meadows, after the election, pushing the White House to overturn the 2020 elections results. Well, tonight, in a letter that was obtained by NBC News, sent by a lawyer from Thomas to the committee, that lawyer says that he has not seen any reason for Thomas to testify and that the committee needs a better justification, in his words, Tom, why it's relevant. Peter Alexander with several updates tonight for us. Peter, we thank you. We want to head overseas now to the NATO meeting. In Spain today, the U.S. announcing a major new military commitment in Europe in response to Russia's war in Ukraine, including a permanent new American base in Poland. Kristen Welker is in Madrid with the latest. Tonight, new video shows the horror when a Russian missile hit that crowded shopping mall in Ukraine. Many still missing from Monday's deadly attack. Ukraine's President Zelensky says Russia is now a terrorist state. All of it intensifying the pressure on world leaders as the critical NATO summit gets underway in Spain. NATO today declaring Russia its most significant and direct threat. We're stepping up. We're proving that NATO is more needed now than it ever has been. In an attempt to counter Russia, today, President Biden announcing plans to bolster U.S. forces in Eastern Europe, including a permanent U.S. base in Poland and increased rotations in the Baltics. That, in addition to billions in military aid already delivered to Ukraine. But President Zelensky addressing NATO today says it's not enough and Ukraine needs $5 billion a month in assistance. We're going to help Ukraine for as long as we can, as fast as we can, and that's happening. We pressed a key Biden National Security Council official, John Kirby. Would you say that Russia is winning this war right now? I would not say that Russia is winning this war. The Ukrainians have... Uh, an unbelievable ability to defend themselves. They are acting bravely and skillfully in the field. We're going to help them continue to do that. All right, Kristen Welker joins us now tonight from Madrid. And Kristen, we just heard John Kirby there talk about the Ukrainians' unbelievable ability to de defend themselves. We're four months into this war. I know you also asked him about how long the U.S. thinks this war will last. That's absolutely right. I asked Kirby if Americans should brace for a years-long war in Ukraine. He didn't want to put a time stamp on it, but he did say the United States is committed to supporting Ukraine until the very end. To that point, he also didn't rule out that at some point down the road, the administration may need to ask Congress for more money, but he said they're just not there right now. The president will hold a news conference tomorrow in Madrid where he will address all of these pressing issues. Tom? All right, Kristen, we thank you for that. Back here at home to the front lines on the abortion battle. Less than a week after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, many states are dealing with major legal disputes when it comes to abortion laws, leaving providers and especially patients struggling to understand what they can and cannot do. NBC's Ann Thompson has more. The battle over Kentucky's abortion trigger law moving to a courtroom today. Your Honor, there is a real vagueness problem here with the trigger bin. Kentucky, one of 12 states where the future of abortion services is now in court, causing confusion for patients, doctors and lawmakers alike. I don't think it could get more confusing. Um, Dr. Gabrielle Goodrick leads Arizona's Camelback Family Planning Clinic, performing abortions until Friday. Now its website says it's temporarily suspended elective abortions, unsure what's legal. So none of us want to get involved in lawsuit or get arrested. If you went ahead and provided abortion services, what's at risk? I think being arrested, charged with a felony, uh, losing your medical license. There are two abortion laws on Arizona's books. One signed this March, which bans abortion after 15 weeks, but does not repeal the second, more restrictive law. That one enacted when Arizona was just a territory, bans all abortions unless the mother's life is in danger. With the overturning of Roe versus Wade, abortion should now be illegal in the state of Arizona. Abortion rights opponents argue for the older law. In effect, does Arizona have two laws on abortion? Arizona does not have two laws on abortion. It has one law that prohibits abortion except to save the life of the mother. It's not confusing. But a county judge blocked that ban in 1973, leaving some to wonder where that law stands. And now the confusion expanding to emergency contraception. A Missouri health system stopped providing emergency contraception after that state banned abortion. 
St. Luke's Health System concerned its clinicians could be in legal jeopardy. Tonight, it reversed course, providing the pills again, but saying the ambiguity of the law continues to cause grave concern. So, Tom, tonight the big question is when will we actually get some clarity on all these laws? The Arizona Attorney General says it is working on a brief to be filed in federal court about that state's abortion laws. That could happen as early as next week. And as soon as tomorrow, we could get a ruling on that request in Kentucky to put a temporary hold on that state's trigger law. It's all very confusing. Tom? It is. Okay, and we thank you. We turn now to the forecast. There's a lot going on with the weather tonight. We're tracking a potential tropical cyclone heading for the Caribbean. But first, take a look at this. This is the Rices Fire in Northern California, threatening more than 500 structures. That blaze growing to nearly 800 acres and still 0% contained. Local evacuations currently underway there. And so with that, let's bring in our NBC meteorologist, Bill Cairns, who joins us now live in studio. So, Bill, what's driving this fire right now? Well, it formed yesterday afternoon. So in about a 24-hour period, it went up to almost 1,000 acres. And CAL FIRE is not fooling around with this one. They took a lot of resources, bulldozers, engines, air support. They're dropping tankers with water on it. And they have 373 firefighters on this blaze right now. They do not want it to spread into a canyon area where then they could lose control of it. So that's the battle that's taking place. It's located just outside of Chico here. And it's kind of near the Orville Dam on its way. If you're driving up from Sacramento towards Reno, it would be on your left as you're going up the highway. And it's been a warm afternoon, so it's been burning pretty good. Temperatures are in the 90s in that region and also pretty windy. Tonight, the winds get quiet, and so that should help. But as far as the tropics go, we are watching that area off the coast of Texas. This is where we could still see a 40% chance of development. And then, as you showed us, we're also watching that system that's heading towards Nicaragua. We already have hurricane watches up for Nicaragua. Okay, so we'll, we'll stay... Uh with some eyes on that throughout the week. We also want to talk about July 4th. I know we're a few days out, but we've been talking about travel as well. Uh, what can people expect for the July 4th forecast? Yeah, we're not seeing anything horrendous. We are going to watch a couple storm systems moving through the country, as you would expect. So let's get you through your Friday. Very hot and humid in the northeast. We have heavy rain from that tropical disturbance around the Houston area. That could have some travel delays. As we head into the weekend on Saturday, scattered storms around the New York City, Philadelphia, D.C. areas could have some minor problems with travel. We're okay in many areas of the west, although it will be pretty hot. By the time we get to Sunday, pretty nice coast to coast. Just a few showers in the mid-Atlantic. And finally, looking all the way out to Monday for your 4th of July forecast, we're going to call this fantastic. Fantastic in the Northeast, not bad in the South. Overall, if you have plans on the fourth, Tom, I think we're looking A okay. Okay, we'll hold you to it. All right, Bill, thank you. Still ahead, paralyzed in custody. The man severely injured after he was caught on camera. Look at this flying around a police van before being dragged into a jail cell. The allegations his family is now making against those officers involved, plus the police officer and state Senate candidate caught on camera punching an opponent at an abortion rights protest. The calls to fire him now coming from his boss. And the bison attack, the man attacked while trying to protect the child from the charging animal in Yellowstone National Park. The warning tonight from officials were not happy with that group of tourists. All right, now to some wild video out of Yellowstone National Park of a bison charging at a group of tourists. Officials saying they were way too close. A man stepping in front of the animal and getting gored to save a child. NBC's Miguel Almaguer has the shocking footage. Tonight, the terrifying moment, a bison charges a group of tourists. A man grabbing a child and shoving him out of the way as the animal attacks and gores him. It happened Monday in Yellowstone National Park. A bystander shooting video of the family standing on a boardwalk when the 1800 pound animal charges. The child and two others standing face to face with the bison. That's when you see the other man rush in to help. Officials from Yellowstone saying the 34 year old sustained an injury to his arm and was rushed to the hospital. The incident showing the dangers of getting too close to wild animals. These are large animals that are capable of high speeds, um, so they deserve respect. The rule uh, that the National Park Service recommends is a minimum of 25 yards uh, distance between people and bison. This is the latest in a series of harrowing incidents in and around Yellowstone. Hey! 
Last year, a bison charging a family who were standing too close. A girl trips and falls while trying to escape. She ends up playing dead. Luckily, she was unhurt. Oh, God. Oh, no, 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 no. In 2018, on a highway in Yellowstone, this man actually taunting a bison in front of shocked onlookers. I can't watch it I think part of the challenge is, is that um, people uh, fail to follow the rules or maybe lose track of how close they've gotten to wildlife in a given situation. And that's where accidents can occur. Luckily, the injuries from Monday's incident weren't more serious, and the child in the bison's path was pulled to safety. But this is a chilling reminder to respect the speed and power of these animals. Miguel Almaguer, NBC News. Okay, now to a Connecticut man whose family says is suffering from paralysis after he was in New Haven police custody. The city releasing body cam video showing him slamming his head when the officer driving hit the brakes. NBC Stephen Romo takes us through the incident and the video tonight. Randy Cross Life Matters! Tonight, a family calls for justice after a man was severely injured while in police custody. Video released by the New Haven Police Department shows the moments when Randy Cox, transported in a police van, slammed against the wall. His attorney, civil rights lawyer, Benjamin Crump. Randy Cox is lying in that hospital bed, paralyzed from his chest down because of the actions and the inactions of the New Haven Police Department. As the investigation continues, Cox's family also claiming he wasn't given proper medical attention, something New Haven's assistant police chief addressed. We have a, a policy that says if someone's in distress in the wagon, you pull over, you call for medical assistance, and you wait. He didn't do that. Police officials say it all started Sunday, June 19th, as a weapons complaint. 36-year-old Cox was arrested for illegal possession of a handgun and loaded into the police van. Video shows Cox sitting on a bench in the back of the vehicle with no seatbelt. Then, in body cam video released by police, you see the officer, identified as Oscar Diaz, driving to a detention center. He swerves the vehicle and honks, <laughs> saying he was avoiding a crash. The loud sound can be heard as well. A view from the back of the vehicle shows Cox thrown forward, colliding with the wall of the cabin. We've blurred the most graphic parts of these images. About four minutes later, body cam video shows Diaz getting out, opening the back of the vehicle, and asking Cox what happened. What happened? Can you move at all? I can't move. I can't move you, so I have to hold that. I'm going to have to go get an ambulance. Back in the driver's seat, Diaz does alert paramedics, but he also continues driving. Then, once at the detention facility, video shows officers lifting Cox up and out of the vehicle. No, you drink too much. Okay, sit up. He appears limp and did not stand on his own. The footage shows Cox slumped in that wheelchair while he's processed before he's eventually dragged across the floor and put in a cell where restraints are placed on his legs. Every case is different, but the, the one thing that's constant throughout is you get people medical attention when they need it. An ambulance arrives later and takes Cox to the hospital where he underwent surgery. According to a press release from the mayor, his injuries may result in paralysis. He has the breathing tubes in, the feeding tubes in, um, so he can't talk. Officer Diaz and four detention officers have been placed on leave, according to city officials. The Connecticut State Police confirm they are assisting in the ongoing investigation. Why didn't the New Haven police officers believe Randy Cox when he said, I can't move? Why did they mock him? City officials in New Haven say they have questions too, and their goal is to be transparent during this process. Based on what I have seen in the video footage, uh, I found in several of the actions taken and several of the actions not taken by the officers uh, to be uh, quite concerning. Quite concerning is right when you look at that video. Stephen Romo joins us now. I know you said the officers involved are going to be put on leave. 
What do we expect to happen to them and, and the department going forward? Yeah, they're still looking into the situation, the agencies involved, but law enforcement analysts say that's really a wide range of outcomes that these officers could face everything from retraining to reassignment. In similar situations, they say there's ter termination has also been on the table. It really just depends. I should note, though, Tom, we did reach out and try to reach Officer Oscar Diaz, but we were unable to reach him. Okay, Stephen Rommel for us. Stephen, we thank you for that. When we come back, a serial, serial killer investigation, the new charges for a convicted murderer in Texas who authorities say may have more than 20 victims. The update next. We are back now with Top Stories Newsfeed. We begin with the new capital murder charges for a suspected Texas serial killer. Billy Chimir Mir is now charged in the murders of four more people in 2017. He's accused of killing more than 20 elderly women over a two-year span. In April, he was sentenced to life in prison for one of those murders. Now to the investigation into a police officer and state Senate candidate who punched his one-time opponent at an abortion rights protest. Jean Lugo, who was off duty at the time, was caught on camera punching another local politician who stepped into a fight during a rally on Friday. In a new report, the chief of the department said Lugo should be fired and that his actions were, quote, disturbing and unprofessional. And Los Angeles will return beach property to the family of a black couple nearly a century after it was seized. The Bruces purchased the land in 1912 to create a seaside resort for black families at a time when many beaches were segregated. After years of harassment, the Manhattan Beach City Council took the land through eminent domain. It's been in the hands of Los Angeles County since the 90s, who unanimously voted to give it back finally to the family. All right, we want to turn now to the latest tech battle. TikTok, once again under the microscope, as the FCC commissioner calls on giants Apple and Google to remove the popular social media app, calling it, quote, a sophisticated surveillance tool used by China to collect user information. NBC's Jacob Ward on the latest privacy concerns. Tonight, TikTok is in deep trouble with the U.S. government. FCC Commissioner Brendan Carr demanding in a letter to Apple and Google that they stop offering one of the world's most popular social media apps because, quote, it harvests swaths of sensitive data that new reports show are being accessed in Beijing. This isn't the first crisis for the wildly popular Chinese-founded company. Carr's letter cites episodes in which researchers found it was collecting sensitive data, including passwords. President Trump, who appointed Carr, sought to ban the app in 2020. We're looking at TikTok. We may be banning TikTok. We may be doing some other things. There are a couple of options. You know, TikTok is, is, is kind of public enemy number one to a lot of privacy uh, watchdogs, especially those in the U.S. government, who worry about China's collection of people. Data. The U.S. military prohibits it on government devices, and India has banned it outright. Carr also cites recent reporting from BuzzFeed News that in spite of assurances that TikTok has moved its data out of China, leaked audio from the company suggests TikTok engineers in Beijing still have access. TikTok calls reports misleading and told NBC News that, quote, engineers in locations outside of the U.S., including China, can be granted access to U.S. user data on an as-needed basis under strict controls. Neither Apple nor Google parent company Alphabet had comment tonight. The FCC letter says TikTok isn't just an app for sharing funny videos or memes. It's, quote, a sophisticated surveillance tool that collects far more data than users realize. One of the reasons we're seeing uh, Brendan Carr, an FCC commissioner, push for the app stores to try to limit it is that is one choke point for a lot of apps to try to pull them out of the app stores. That doesn't necessarily mean it'll stop working on your phone, but it would almost certainly mean you wouldn't be able to download. Of course, this is not unique to TikTok. It's the business model of all major platforms. For example, Sheryl Sandberg, the outgoing Facebook executive, pioneered collecting consumer data as a way of targeting advertising, first at Google and then at Facebook. Facebook, now called Meta, made over 90% of its revenue that way, more than $100 billion in 2021. But TikTok now faces deletion for allegedly sharing that sort of data abroad. Jake Ward, NBC News, San Francisco. All right, we thank Jake for that. With the FCC now sounding the alarm about data security on TikTok, we want to bring in a top story favorite, Angela Senadella. She's the lawyer, Angela, on TikTok with nearly 1 million followers. So you're on this platform, you're on this app. Are you worried at all about China stealing your information? 
I'm not worried today, but if there actually is a national security threat, I want the government to be investigating it. I don't want Google or Apple to be investigating it. They're not exactly privacy watchdogs themselves. Good point. What is the fear here? What can China be stealing from TikTok? I'm, I'm doing a video about ironing a shirt or a video of me dancing, doing the running man. What, what is China stealing? Right, so stealing is a questionable word choice there because TikTok in their privacy policy tells you exactly what they take. And they do take your biometric data. They take your username. They take your location info. They take a lot of data that could be sensitive, but frankly, is the same that all of the other apps are taking and Google and Apple themselves. So you're a lawyer. You're on TikTok. What kind of action do you want the FCC to take and or Apple and Google? So if a foreign government is actually going to take my data and in some way use that to harm me or harm the country, then I want them to look into that. But as of now, there is no data that actually supports that. All there is is that Chinese engineers are able to view the videos that I am making. To me, that is not a threat because I don't put anything on there that I would be worried about China stealing anyway. Right. The big picture here for people not familiar with TikTok, because so much is written about Twitter and Facebook. I know you're very savvy when it comes to social media. How big is TikTok? TikTok is massive, and I think today it's bigger than almost Google. They say the downloads in the app stores are so huge and so significant. So I understand there could be a fear that if China does have access to videos all across the U.S., constant video streaming content, that could be dangerous. But I think the government should be the one who should be investigating this. Again, not Google or Apple. Also, where are Apple phones made? They're all made in China. Right. Good point. Angela Sanadella, that's why we had you on today. Thank you so much for that perspective. Okay, we turn now to Top Stories Global Watch and the violent unrest after the killing of a man in India was recorded. Protests erupting in the state after two Muslim men killed a Hindu man with meat cleavers and filmed the attack. The suspects say it was in retaliation for remarks made by a politician on the Prophet Muhammad. Officials in that state now implementing a curfew and blocking internet access after the video was shared on social media. And an update tonight on the three Americans found dead at a Sandals resort in the Bahamas. You may remember we did several reports on this. Local authorities revealing the three tourists died of asphyxiation in May due to carbon monoxide poisoning. It is unclear if the villas had been equipped with carbon monoxide detectors or if they were working. A fourth person survived and was airlifted to the hospital. And protests over rising fuel costs now spreading throughout South America. Here are some of the images in Argentina Police blocking an entry point into Buenos Aires as they try to prevent more truckers from entering the capital city. Protest over diesel shortages and prices have been ongoing for weeks. Peru's truckers are now on a national strike after the government failed to act on rising fuel and fertilizer prices. And the cost of gas and rising inflation also sparking widespread protests across Ecuador. Several people have been killed, including a soldier on a fuel convoy. Okay, we want to move on now to eastern Ukraine where... One of the last strongholds in the arena in the area is crumbling at the hands of Russian forces. Authorities say three quarters of the area is devastated. The Ukrainians are outnumbered but determined. Alex Crawford from Sky News has this story. This is the hell that's Lysyshanks, and it's a hell that never falls silent. Look to the right of that huge black plume of smoke. That fresh puff is yet another shell exploding on an horizon already foggy with destruction. The city's being surrounded by Russian troops bit by bloody bit. This bridge over the railway was the main route in. The Russian circle's nearly complete. The attackers are using brute force to sledgehammer their way in from several directions. We drove in as they mounted their latest ferocious onslaught on the city's oil refinery, the second largest in Ukraine. It felt akin to riding into some sort of Armageddon. Lysyshanks is the last remaining stronghold in the Luhansk region of the Donbass. Losing this city will be a monumental loss. Part of the plant is on fire. Many other areas have been hit badly. There are shells coming in every few minutes. But the Ukrainians are fighting the fight of their lives. And they've been battling over this pocket of the Donbass for months. We're with the soldiers of the 24th Brigade, sworn to secrecy about their exact location inside the plant. They're on the move to another fighting position. The Russian troops are 500 meters away, and they've come under savage attack here. 
but they're bitterly disappointed about losing their twin city of Severodonetsk. It's made their defense of Lysy Shanks all the more important. They don't want to give up an inch of territory, but they followed their orders. Yes, it was the right decision, he says. Better to save lives. They've held the Russians at bay for weeks now, forcing some heavy losses on them and buying time to build up defenses in Donetsk, the second half of the Donbass where the Russians will move to next. But they're coming under intense pressure on the Donbass battlefield, and even relocating involves casualties as they're forced to run the gauntlet of fresh shelling. Amid the mayhem of this grim fighting, the explosions and hurry to shift has led to a head-on crash. The injured are having to be rapidly extracted and treated, whilst the heavy smog offers them some slight cover. Those who make it out alive from the line of fire are utterly exhausted and high on relief and almost surprised they're still in one piece. But there's a growing exasperation at what they see as the delay in sending long-range artillery and better weapons for them to somehow finish this fighting. It would be much better if you send us some new weapons. Are you struggling with this, the stuff you've got at the moment? Well, I can't say that we're struggling, but it would be much better, you know. Mm -hmm. They take high losses, we need to retreat, but in the end, again, they will go forward again, we will beat them with artillery, they will, again, they have a, gr a great amount of losses. So like, what, what's your message to NATO and the rest of Europe? Stop being the foot soldiers aren't mincing their words anymore. <laughs> Civilians led us to the body of a Russian soldier, which they say was dumped out of the captured personnel carrier. He'd obviously been badly hurt and had a tourniquet around his leg. The discarded Russian army uniforms were laid out for the residents to see. While the police documented all the evidence for any future investigation, including exactly how he died and what he was doing. With no electricity, there's no operating morgue, but his DNA will be taken to try to identify him. Volunteers have the awful task of bagging the corpse. Then the body is loaded into one of the few operating vehicles in the city. A larder so small, one of the volunteers has to sit cradling the dead Russian soldier on his lap whilst his colleagues finish up gathering his personal items. Both life and death in Lissy Shanks is utterly surreal. That was Sky News' Alex Crawford with the stunning realities in eastern Ukraine right now. All right, coming up, remembering an American hero from Iwo Jima, the legacy he left, including his heroic actions on the battlefield and his continued fight for veterans back home. Stay with us. Tonight, we are remembering a hero, Herschel Woody Williams, the last surviving Medal of Honor recipient of World War II. He died today at the age of 98. If you don't recognize his name, just listen to his story and what he did with a flamethrower. It's the stuff of legends. Here's NBC's Courtney Cubian. Today, a chapter closed in American history. The last living Medal of Honor recipient from World War II, Herschel Williams, affectionately known as Woody, passed away. Born on a West Virginia dairy farm in 1923, he enlisted in the Marine Corps and was sent to Iwo Jima with the 3rd Marine Division in February 1945. Marines had been fighting to take the island for four days, raising the iconic flag over Mount Suribachi. It not only lifted our spirits here on this rock, it lifted the spirits of America. But Woody's Marines were pinned down by Japanese troops firing from fortified bunkers. Using a flamethrower, Woody fought for four hours, stopping the attack and saving U.S. lives. It wasn't anything outstanding that particular day. It was just another day of battles. In October 1945, President Truman presented him with the Medal of Honor, but Woody said it didn't belong to him. And he said, this medal is not mine. It belongs to all those Marines who didn't come back. I only hold it in trust. Woody returned home and continued to serve for more than 65 more years at the Department of Veterans Affairs and then until his final days working with Gold Star families. 
Woody lived a life that reminded everybody how easy it was to do the right thing. He was a mentor to a lot of us. The Marine Corps is fortunate to have many heroes, but there is only one Woody Williams, Semper Fidelis Marine. Woody Williams was 98 years old. Courtney Cuby, NBC News, the Pentagon. Thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.